Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Born to Read. It's been a while since we've done a Born to Read. We've had some awesome normal episodes going on recently. Yeah. But we figured it was time to get back to the hit the books again. Mm-hmm. So we're, we're back this week with another episode of Born to Read with one of our favorite books or one of my favorite books yeah, that I, I've read I haven't, in the last year. I haven't read it. You haven't read it. And it's not that long, so I'm kind of wondering what the holdup is. Why, just, why you have it. I don't have it. Just don't. Um, well, I'll Can I borrow it. it? I'll let you loan it. Okay. Um, $20 a day. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's only 100 pages or 110 yeah. pages. I should be able to finish it in like an hour. Yeah, it's not that long. The book is called Productivity, A Practical Theology of Work and Wealth by the Douglas Wilson. Yep. Um, and I actually think it's kind of timely to, to discuss this here as we get into the new year, you know, new year's resolutions, how many people get to the new year and go, I want to be more productive this year. And now we're here, we're here at the end of January and everybody's kind of like, yeah, never mind. <laughs> yeah. That's when you start realizing all your goals were just pipe dreams yeah. and you're like, never mind. <laughs> it's uh, never going to happen. Not, not worth it. Yeah, so I'm just I'm interested in this book because I'm a pretty busy guy. I wonder how it could help me. Would you say that it's like profitable to the to the young man who's you know every young man should be busy? Yeah, well, I think it's it's a different type of uh, productivity book, and he's not going to give you a magic solution for it. Oh, okay. Um, the definition that he gives of productivity um, is the practice of plodding away at a pile of work instead of frantically trying to sprint through it all. Okay. Being graceful and uh, being stable and graceful like a buffalo upon the plains, not frantic like a prairie dog or road runner. Oh, okay. So he, he's, he's looking at this like, you know, you have, you have a lot to do that. There's a lot to, to get through. Yeah. Um, but you don't want to go so quickly that you burn yourself out. Mm-hmm. Um, Cause so many people, burn themselves out thinking that productivity is um, getting lots of things done. And so right in the the opening introduction, he says, I feel um, attacked, by the way, (laughs) (laughs) as you enter into the accounting busy season and get bombarded with everything. um, What he says, uh, he he quotes uh, Peter Drucker and says, uh, efficiency is doing things right. Effectiveness is doing the right things. Um, and so then he, he goes into, uh, the first half of the book is a theology of productivity. Okay. And so he, he's breaking down, why are we supposed to be productive and, and, you know, breaks it down through a lot of, uh, different avenues, um, all of which are excellent. Uh, I'm interested to know. So plotting yeah, how you gave that illustration of the Buffalo prancing through the field is kind of slow, but powerful. Right. Does he, what does he say about procrastination? Because the tendency is to like procrastinate until the last minute and then just frantically rush through it and get it done, pull an all nighter, you know? So what does he say about procrastination? Well, procrastinate, that's what he's talking about is procrastination is like letting that pile of work build up for you Mm -hmm. where you want to be slowly but surely working away at those things. And procrastination is oftentimes just an overwhelmingness of the work is overwhelmingness even a word? I don't know, it is now. Okay, I'm gonna patent that one. Um, <laughs> you can patent words. <laughs> I guess I can. I'm making up all sorts of new rules today. <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, so that that idea of procrastination is you need to work hard today and get what's done in front of you done today. Um, but you don't have. But so you don't have to get. So it's kind of like the balance of. You're, there's not so much to be done that you're frozen in panic and you're overwhelmed and it freezes you up. Right. But you're also not procrastinating in the, in the middle ground is just, I'm just going to plod through today what I can get done today without overwhelming myself and just doing that day in and day out yeah. consistently. And so he, he breaks down, it's actually funny, some of, the, some of the really practical insights you get from this is from the foreword written by his daughter. Okay. So it, his daughter goes, okay, I've, I've read, I've watched him and live his life and seen the things that he's gotten done. And so when he writes a book about productivity, we know that he knows what he's talking about. Yeah. How many books has he 
written a lot, like over a hundred. Yeah. Um, so that, that was one of those really interesting things, but, um, you know, being able to adopt some of these, uh, the, the ideas of it, the first chapter is a theology of work. He wants to address, okay, we need to work hard. Then he gets into a theology of wealth and a theology of tools are kind of where he gets down. And this is what I really thought was interesting uh, as the perspective that he, um, he's like, we live in an age of technology and we don't really have a category for a lot of our technology from scripture. And we don't have much of a frame of reference, but he goes, if we take our smartphone and say, our smartphone is not exactly, um, it, it doesn't really fit neatly into any biblical category, but he says, this is the most similar to wealth. Um, we think we often think of wealth as money, but what it actually, it, what this is actually doing is this is giving us a resource where we can do things that we otherwise couldn't do. We're reaching farther. We're, um, we're able to be more productive. Things that we can do on our smartphones and on our laptops are more um, easily done now than they would have been without them. Hmm. And so, but he's like, uh, one of my favorite illustrations that he gives is, look at what your smartphone can do. And most of us are just using it for one or two things. This is like having 10,000 servants managing your estate and putting three of them to work and letting the rest of them sit on the back porch drinking lemonade. <laughs> Guilty. It was like, oh man, that's a, it was, it was a really interesting, um, it was a really interesting perspective of it. Um, cause you have, you often have these, you know, productivity junkies that will want you to max out your, your computer. Here's all these programs that you can use to, if, make your day more efficient. Mm -hmm. Then there's the other people who are like the, the phone and the tablets and the computers are ruining your uh, productivity. Get rid of them. Right. Um, and he want he, his not um, advocating for either side of that. He's saying, let's have techno fullness, mm. um, not technophobia, not technophilia, technophobia or techno fullness. Uh, let's, let's use it to its potential mm. so that our work is done to the glory of God. Right. That's good. I have a good example of that. Actually, I tried to delete Facebook. Well, I did actually for like a few months to uh, study for the CPA exam. Mm -hmm. And I found myself missing it because I was a part of a CPA exam group on Facebook where mm -hmm. I could ask questions and search the database in there and get questions answered. And so I was like, I could theoretically exercise what some people call self-control right and i could have facebook on my phone and only go on it to go into that group so that's what i started doing and it was crazy facebook became for me a tool right to achieve a goal in my life as opposed to an addiction and a distraction yeah which i'm probably more back in the addiction stage right now <laughs> <laughs> it goes in and out I, I feel that yeah here's one of my favorite quotes from it as he's talking about productivity here well and i guess we should back up and really kind of okay. define a little bit more of what the the idea of uh, productivity looks like and i think with born to read um reading books i've gotten several questions and i know you've gotten some questions like do you guys actually read a book a week to be able to to read to review these books tim does <laughs> <laughs> um the answer is sometimes yeah, but the even before I read this book, this was how I was um, adopting my reading habits. Was for a long time, I would read a book, I would start a book, and I would go, "Oh, I want to read this book, but I don't really feel like reading this book. I want to start that other book, but I can't start that other book until I finish this one. So now I'm feeling <laughs> like I can't start that one, and so then I end up reading neither yeah. of them." <laughs> So what I ended up starting to do at the beginning of last year was I would sit down and I would go, okay, one, I'd ask myself, do I want to read tonight? If I want to read tonight, I sit down and I go, what do I want to read tonight? And then I start reading those book, uh, that book. You read like whatever you feel like you what, want whatever to read. I, whatever I feel like I want to read that okay. night. Um, and so as I would read that in that time, um, you know, sometimes it was, I was reading the same book three, four nights in a row. Sometimes I was reading five different books in that night. So right now I've got six different books that I'm reading. <laughs> so whenever, whenever I feel like I'm, I, I want to sit down and read a book, which one do I want to read? And mm -hmm. I, I'll sit down and read that. And that's how I read 
all those books last year, hmm. um, plus audiobooks while you're commuting to and from work also help. But that, yeah. that's what he advocates for in here too, is just slowly um, chipping away at different things. Multitasking doesn't help anybody, but handling one thing at a time slowly over time actually ends up accomplishing more. Hmm. And so then he says, um, we must recognize that things are muddled up even further by those who call themselves progressives, <laughs> who have absolutely no standard to measure progress by, and hence no way of defining whether or not progress has occurred. They like it this way because shortly after their policies kick in, everything starts to look pretty regressive, but they can't see it that way because they insist on standing backwards. They insist on standing backwards, facing up the down escalator. <laughs> so well, he's advocating for let's make progress moving forward and have an actual standard by which we can measure progress don't right. do, don't do busy work because people um you know i always think of it when you're like i have 15 things on my to-do list and the first five things i did were not on my to-do list so i'm going to add those five things and i can cross five things off of my to-do list Ta-da! <laughs> i was productive <laughs> Makes today <you> feel good <laughs> um but that's not ac- that's not actually being productive. Yeah. So you're lying. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, this reminds me of uh, this. There's an article I believe it's on purelypresbyterian.com, uh, and it's a theology of business by a old head. He's dead. I don't remember his name, but he he says like a lot of young men don't get knowledge before they jump into business. Mm. Like we're all too eager to do this, this, that, and the other, but we don't want to get the knowledge beforehand. Does Wilson talk about like getting knowledge before you're able to be productive? Because you can sit down with a pile of work, but if you don't know how to do it, how you can do it? Yeah, I wouldn't say he he addresses that so much in the. You know, it it wasn't he didn't address things in a super practical sense like here's here's your five steps make sure you have this this and this because i think and i think that's a good thing the way he does it is that he applies it generally and broadly and he goes here's a here's an understanding of what work is and then you need to figure out what what the work is in front of you and what you need to do to 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 get it done Hmm. um so if you're a cpa you want to be an accountant do i want to study accounting do i need to get my cpa before i be become an accountant right um well as um, can i cut you off as as time winds down i saw this in the table of contents uh-oh. at the end it says eschatology <gasps> did mr wilson uh sneak in postmillennialism into this book. That's that's what I really want to know. He did, but it was actually kind of funny because as I remember, it wasn't in that um it wasn't in that chapter. Um it was in the following chapter. It was like I, I thought it was hmm. kind of funny. Every chapter seemed like the title of that chapter made more sense for the chapter after it. Hmm. But I think that was part of uh, that was probably intentional as he's like trying to build towards something. Yeah. But that's what he's talking about um in in terms of the the eschatological view of work is that we're trying, we're, we are trying to build to something. We're trying to move. Um, we're not, we're not working for the short term. We're not working frantic like a squirrel. We're trying to move like a Buffalo. We're trying to make progress towards something. Um, hmm. So, yeah, I just listened to this uh, thing called postmillennialism and patriarchy is hmm. uh, by Jared Sparks at the postmillennialism conference, put on by cruciform ministries. Okay. And he he says that when people become postmillennial, they obvi- they automatically start to embrace biblical patriarchy because they realize that their work is not just for them; it's also for their great grandkids. Yeah, and so that that causes a head of a household to act in a different way. You really have to start taking control because your actions aren't just going to affect the next ten years until the rapture happens. Yeah. Your actions, your work, your productivity is for your great grandchildren. Yep. So I I should read this book. I yep. really should. Everybody should. What's your what's your rating? I'll give it a I'll give it a ten. Um really it was is a nice and quick and easy read. I even read it in a in traffic one day. 
using some of the principles. Not that he's an, uh, advocating for reading while driving. <laughs> right. um, so there was one day I pulled out of I pulled out of the office on my way home from work, and it was like um, bumper to bumper traffic. I was like, I guess I'm just going to read right <laughs> while I'm here. <laughs> I read like two chapters on my way home. Just are you bump, serious? Bump, bumper to bumper traffic. I was like, okay, that's hilarious. It took me forty minutes to get home, so I'd be reading, and then the car in front of me would move. I'd look up and I'd pull forward, and then get back to reading. I was like, oh, that's yeah. awesome. I read two chapters on the way home from work. Wow, that's risky. Don't try that at home, guys. Yeah, leave it. Leave it to the um, what is it? Paid actor. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> is it? Is that your first ten rating for a book? Oh wait, no, Man of the House maybe. Yeah, I think Man of the House was pretty good. This one was, yeah, because and and ultimately to to wrap this one up is the point here is that work ethic is important, but it often gets um, sidetracked um, or interpreted as this having to go 100 miles an hour all the time that a a work ethic is you are moving at 100 miles an hour. Um, But this uh, this book here, Productivity, a Practical Theology of Work and Wealth. really helps reprioritize the the view of mm. work um, and shift to a, a mentality that's a little bit more sustainable in the long run. Okay. So, yeah, again, the book is Productivity, A Practical Theology of Work and Wealth by Douglas Wilson. You can get it from uh, Canon Press or wherever books are sold. Mm-hmm. Uh, this has been another episode of Born to Read. We thank you guys for joining us. We will catch you guys next time. See ya.